All right. Well, welcome everybody to yet another journal club presented to you by Leaf Life Extension and Advocacy Foundation over here in New York City, broadcasting from the Cooper Union, where uh, as a reminder to everybody, we're going to be having an awesome conference in a very short period of time coming up in July. So basically the second week of July, July uh, 11th and 12th. Uh, we're going to have a two-day extravaganza with um, a lot of great speakers coming up over at the Rose Auditorium, which is actually here in this building, um, which is 41 Cooper Square. So mark that down on your calendars. If you haven't picked up any tickets, please visit our website, lifespan.io. I think it's like slash conferences. Um, and do check it out. Uh, we should have the program schedule up today. If not today, then tomorrow. So you can check out all the great speakers that we have um, you know, um, for you guys. All right, so uh, today's Journal Club, it's a little bit different. Um, we usually talk about cells and we usually talk about cells in the context of aging. Uh, we're gonna talk about all the in-between stuff right now, which is um, the extracellular matrix and particularly the things that can go wrong with the extracellular matrix, which is basically the glue um, that holds cells together. I mean, that's just a very crude approximation. It does a lot more than that. It directs cells. Um, you know, tells them where to go, so to speak, when there's uh, damage that occurs, but um, the ECM itself can become damaged um, as time goes by. And particularly a bunch of um, things can go awry, uh, crosslinks can happen, which are termed advanced glycation end products. And uh, kind of a huge um, component of anti-aging research has been, you know, looking for substances that can prevent or break these advanced glycation end products. So we have a kind of a first in kind keeper uh, that we're going to be discussing here. It's a little bit different in that, A, we're talking about something that affects, you know, the ECM, and B, this paper is like a really basic research paper. I don't mean basic as in bad and simple. I mean basic as in very fundamental in that we usually have been covering papers, um, you know, in, in mouse trials and um, a couple of papers in, in very kind of preliminary human trials, but this is a, you know, enzymatic paper and looking at um, enzymes that have been identified for the first time that can break some of these, you know, advanced uh, glycation end products, or, you know, rather than just intermediates. Um, so here with me is uh, Steve Fatima Sven, and Sven has actually worked in the lab of the paper that we um, were discussing here, um, the Spiegel lab, um, and Victor. So let's, uh, let me sh screen share here. Um, and let's see, before we go into, well, let me, um, let me screen share the paper itself. And then um, let me click on this here and see if you can see that. Can you see all this, all these pictures here, um, Steve? Is this, that sharing okay? Um, so there's a picture of some, yeah. there's some buns here. So, so what does this have to do with aging? Well, um, this is, um, so these are some egg, egg roll, egg buns, um, and this is a chicken <laughs> before and after being um, roasted, very tasty. Um, these go well together. Um, and, you know, this is, a, this is something called a, you know, uh, basically a category of reactions that were um, identified in the early 20th century by a, a French chemist, Maillard. And these reactions basically involve uh, condensation of sugars with proteins. Right, so this is what gives it these, you know, foods their tasty kind of brown, succulent, flavorful uh, coating uh, that we so enjoy. Um, we don't really so enjoy this type of browning as it occurs within our extracellular matrix, and that's basically what can happen, uh, you know, to you know the stuff in between our cells in our skin um, and in our you know, cardiovascular system as we grow old. And, and also it's accelerated in certain diseases um, such as uh, diabetes, where you have lots of glucose floating around in the bloodstream. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, you know, and these end results are essentially advanced glycation end products, right? So I've got some uh, chat window just came up. Spiegel Lab, are you able to hide the top of your share at all, Oliver? If not, don't worry. Um, I don't know, the top of my share, I'm not sure. Um, is that hidden right now? Can we see the paper? Okay, 
So that's kind of a quick summary of, of and Sven, please feel free to chime in um, anything in depth you'd like to add about advanced glycation and product. So I'm gonna put my Zoom chat right here in the corner. Um, so what is this paper all about? Well, uh, the title uh, says it, Biocatalytic Reversal of Advanced Glycation and Product Modification. Um, so why is this a big deal? People have been looking at this for a long time. Well, uh, according to this paper, and I'm gonna kind of quote from this, um, this comes at the very end of their introduction. To the best of our knowledge, this study provides the first biochemical characterization of a biocatalyst, i.e. an enzyme, that's capable of reversing a mature AGE um, in a peptide context. Um, and they isolate this enzyme uh, from E. coli. So I'm going to stop sharing this. So that's basically what this paper is all about. It's basically isolating an enzyme um, using a screen that they developed, uh, which is kind of a neat screen um, from, uh, from a mutant form of E. coli, and we'll kind of get to that in, in a moment. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of get to the sort of to the uh, end of the chase here and say um, this paper does not uh, identify an enzyme that is of therapeutic value at the moment. So if you're thinking that this paper has identified an enzyme that you can start taking right now and it's going to reverse your crosslinks, this is very preliminary. It, it's not. Um, it's the first of its kind. And for me, the, the, the real importance of this paper is laying the groundwork for the type of actually um, screen um, to identify better enzymes that are out there that can um, do this type of cleavage reaction. Um, to me, uh, the authors don't really stress the screen that much, but I think it's pretty neat because it's a, you know, it's, it's an old fashioned screen. Basically it's a genetic screen looking at, um, looking at enzymes and, you know, trying to identify enzymes and then using those enzymes that you, you know, that you pulled out of uh, microbes and then potentially modifying them so they work better, right? Um, so that's kind of the gist of the paper. And they pull out this one enzyme that uh, is in a pathway and it does something completely different. It's called MNN, MNMC and it's a bacterial tRNA modifying enzyme. Um, so let's go back to sharing the screen. Um, so scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. So, okay. So what is this screen? So what are you, what are you looking at here? So, uh, so two of these, um, glycation end products are, um, carboxymethylysine and carboxyethylysine, um, right? So this is a representation of this kind of uh, bond right here that's, that uh, they wish to break that's representative of some of these advanced glycation end products. And the screen that they do is pretty simple actually. And it's kind of a surprise that people haven't done this before because it's a type of screen that um, I could imagine, and this is, this, this is, I'm saying this is a, is, a, is a positive for the authors here, you know, the type of screen I can imagine scientists doing in the 1960s to, you know, to pull, to identify microbes from the wild and uh, doing interesting things. So, um, so what they do is they reason that, okay, these cells need lysine to survive. So they need to basically cleave off the lysine residue um, from this carboxymethyl lysine and carboxyethyl lysine um, that are found in advanced glycation end products. So they have a, um, uh, they have a mutant form, they have an E. coli lysine oxytrope, meaning that this, mute, this E. coli, it's a lab strain of E. coli, can't, you know, uh, can't synthesize lysine, so it's got to get lysine from, from the wild. So instead of feeding these microbes lysine, um, they're supplementing them with these um, compounds that they're hoping the microbes have some sort of enzyme in them that can break them down and liberate the lysine and then grow. So it, it's, a, it's a screen that, you know, generations of geneticists and, and microbiologists, you know, would be familiar with, with, uh, you know, with this type of setup. Um, so here we have a positive control and this cloudiness just tells you um, the growth of the microbes. They probably somewhere in supplemental, they have growth curves, but okay. So, um, so growing in lysine, um, carboxymethylysine, not so good of a substrate, but the carboxyethylysine, which they focus on as, um, you know, this age product, um, it supports growth, uh, and this is a negative control M9 only media. Um, 
and they do this, and they basically, uh, what they do then is they do this transposon mutagenesis. So basically they knock out genes randomly and they see which of these cells now can't grow on, you know, carboxyethylysine. So, you know, it's a, it's a very traditional genetic screen to then, you know, um, look at the phenotype and then basically make defects and say, does the phenotype go away? And if it does, where did this, where did this mutagenesis kind of land in, right? What did it screw up? And it screwed up, it landed in this gene, um, and actually a different gene, NMNG, I think. Um, so th this is part of a pathway that is used, um, it's, it's an enzyme that basically modifies a tRNA, um, I'm not gonna go into, um, wobble uh, U34 tRNA modifications, but basically a tRNA, and tRNAs basically have amino acids attached to nucleic acids. And this enzyme is required, it does two things. It's, so this is kind of important. This enzyme has two domains, it's a C-terminal domain and an N-terminal do domain. Both of them catalyze two reactions that in the end basically get rid of this carboxy end, right? So that's basically what they're trying to do here is liberate this carboxy end here. And so this enzyme does something roughly similar, um, but, you know, different enough. I guess the binding site for this enzyme is, you know, is, uh, is sort of enough that uh, it's going to, could utilize the CEL um, carboxyethylysine as a substrate. Um, so the N-terminal domain catalyzes this um, this methylation of the, you know, the uh, nitrogen, the amine group that's on the end here, uh, this C-terminal basically does the initial decarboxylation. So this is kind of what they're later going to be focusing on, right? And this is in comparison, so this is what happens natively with the uh, MNNC um, enzyme that's been already characterized in the literature. And this is what, you know, they're saying is what the cell cleavage is, you know, has to occur, which is release of this group um, and liberates L-lysine, right? So, um, so here's the kind of the similarity of, of these two reactions. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. So to me, this was like, to me, this was like sort of like the, you know, the, um, you know, the rest of the paper is the characterization of MNMC um, and also C and MMC because what they look at also is the carboxy terminal um, form. Um, so they, and, and um, again, to kind of jump to the chase, the carboxy terminal form, once you cleave it from the native enzyme, actually the, the enzyme uh, kinetics are a bit better. Um, so the bottom line is this enzyme isn't very good at what it does, but it's the first kind of one that's been isolated. Um, and, uh, they don't talk about this a lot in the paper, um, but I'm gonna kind of stress this here is, um, I'd love to see this screen applied to, you know, a whole bunch of other um, microbes out in the wild because they, they just use E. coli. They later say that they, you know, they, they also t test um, MNMCs from uh, different, uh, different bacteria and they have it somewhere um, in a later figure. Um, I think they test like five different, you know, I, I'm going to just throw out a name here, B. subtilis maybe, and some other, um, some other well-known um, microbes. But, um, but it'd be interesting to, to, to basically, you know, do a screen from microbes that you isolate from the soil. And now that you've got the screen, you know, um, see what happens, right? See if you can, you can pull out a whole bunch of, you know, a whole bunch of microbes that can, that can, uh, thrive or have better growth curves using CML and CEL or other types of ages, advanced glycation end products, um, you know, other ages that you can use as a food substrate. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm a little surprised that, uh, you know, I, I haven't deep dived into the literature here, but I'm surprised nobody has done a modification of the screen to basically look for um, those types of activities. Um, I know in uh, Aubrey's book, um, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, looking for enzymes that can, um, I guess, catalyze, uh, catalyze certain, you know, misfolded proteins. And, you know, um, he kind of says a great place to look for that is in graveyards, right? Uh, because you have decomposing bodies there and a lot of old people, well, not used to be old people, dead people now. 
but um, but you have a you know you have food substrates right for these microbes. So I mean, or you know, it doesn't have to be people; it could be animals, right? So uh, so clearly, ends you know, enzymes have evolved over a period of time to use a lot of different substrates. So there's a lot that could be done with kind of you know, and and the fact that they pulled out to me an enzyme that already shows you know some activity um, using kind of a run-of-the-mill E. coli, lab strain E. coli, without having to really kind of go, you know, into the wild and look through all sorts of soil samples, um, I think bodes well for, for that kind of screen or that kind of search, right? So to me, that's, um, you know, I think screens are cool. I think well, well-designed well screens are very, very cool. I don't, I think people these days, I'm going to go on a little rant here, but you know, obviously doing the bioinformatics stuff is really, really, really important, but you need to have stuff to feed into your bioinformatics pipeline. And, um, you know, we need more people out there literally digging the dirt and, and find, you know, and finding uh, new things that can be then analyzed, right? So, I don't know, maybe it's just a, maybe just a, the pendulum kind of swings. Obviously, we have the computational power nowadays, so people are more comfortable sitting in front of the screen than hauling a bag of dirt around from, you know, from, from the environment. Um, but uh, every time, it just seems every time somebody does, puts together a cool screen, something is al always found that's really cool. And, um, you know, a lot of times screens in general tend to be put down by people as just a mere hunting expedition. You don't know what you're looking for, so you're just going on a search. But that's not true. I mean, if you design a good screen, then clearly you know what you're looking for. Right. So you, you basically the, the screen is there as a kind of a sieve to help capture um, what you're panning for. Um, anyway, so that's my spiel. And I hope to see more screens, you know, developed um, because uh, they are very promising. And the fact that they're able to isolate this enzyme that isn't a great enzyme, but the fact that they're the first one, supposedly, to the best of their knowledge, to have done so using a plain laboratory grade of E. coli, that's a lysine oxytroph you know, without having to go into the jungles of the Amazon or to a graveyard crypt to go look for microbes, uh, bodes well for a more kind of thorough screen. So that's, that is what I'm gonna say about that. All right. Um, so for me, that was, that was the most exciting part of the paper. The enzyme itself, like I said, it's, you know, it's not, not so great, um, but it works, you know. Uh, so they, they set up a whole bunch of different assays, right? So, um, took me a while to kind of go through them, but, um, basically, uh, I'm going to have to refresh my memory here. This is figure three, figure two. Um, so they kind of, they kind of go back and forth here. Um, later in the paper, they, they, they describe, uh, they use a the C terminal domain, but they also use the full length uh, full length enzyme. The assay that they're using here is based on so they do a so kind of jumping ahead. I'm going to scroll through here, but they 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 do a um, a comparison of crystal structures between MMC1 and um, this D amino acid oxidase for humans, and you know show that there's like the similarity of structure. And there's an enzyme based assay where um, you know, the enzyme catalyzes a reaction releasing, you know, um, basically an alpha keto acid um, decar decarboxylation and an ammonia. And they want to set up a similar assay with the cell, which is what is being broken down by C, M, and C, and to liberate pyruvic acid. Now, when you read the paper, they have to do a secondary reaction because um, you're gonna have to read the paper a little bit, but this pyruvic acid later gets decomposed. So this type of um, assay can't detect pyruvic acid. It has to detect this pyruvic acid adduct. Uh, bottom line is it's a color-based assay, colorimetric assay. So the more cell gets broken down, the more of this pyruvic acid gets liberated, the more of this adduct gets formed. And this reaction basically makes this um, brownish compound, which has an absorbance of 445 nanometers. Um, so this is very, the, this figure here is very basic. They're basically 
trying to come up with an assay that shows that they can demonstrate that this enzyme can break down cell. Um, and this peak here represents this, you know, 444 nanometer product that's liberated. Uh, 10 nanomole cell only, so that's their negative control. This is their, uh, I believe their positive control. And this is 10 millimolar cell with MNMC and one millimolar. So they're getting this shift, right? And later they do this uh, liquid chromatography mass spectroscopy um, validation um, to show that these products are being generated as well. So here is a positive control and here is a kind of an increase with cell plus MNMC and a negative control, just the enzyme and just the cell, right? So this enzyme seems to be breaking down um, and these products. And again, I'm gonna, probably these figures aren't in best order, but I'm just gonna zoom in. If you're interested in the kinetic parameters, MNMC1 has a KM, which is basically, you know, um, how well this enzyme is bonding, binding stuff of 5.2 millimolar, and then a KCAT, which is the catalytic efficiency. So the KM is basically half the concentration required to get half Vmax or half the catalytic rate of the reaction. Um, and then they look at CMNMC, ah, I keep getting tongue, tongue tied saying this, CMNMC uh, enzyme, which is just the carboxy terminal end, <clears throat> which in the previous figure is the reaction they're concerned about. The KMs are similar. The KCAT is a little bit, well, actually significantly faster, several fold faster. So they speculate in the paper that the end terminal domain might have some sort of, you know, um, negative effect on the enzymatic rate because of this. Um, so those are, you know, those are the enzymatics. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here, take a little breather. Um, so any questions, anybody wants to add anything? So they do the characterization of the enzyme a little further. Um, again, uh, the carboxy terminal end is a bit better, actually five-fold better enzymatically. Um, there's some things, you know, I made a lot of notes to myself reading this. So um, this paper, uh, they use a variety of different substrates, um, you know, and the substrates they use are, you know, are, are okay. You know, they use small peptidomimetic substrates. So basically we'll go back to the figure um, and they use these cyclic peptides as well. Um, one of the, the peptidomimetics they use, and that's uh, the carboxyethylysine that's bonded to this small peptide that's about six or seven amino acids long, is known as a substrate for um, receptors for ages, so rages, receptor for advanced glycation end products, which activates the NF-kappa B pathway and leads to you know, cell stress. So they you know, claim that this peptidomimetic is a good substrate because it also binds to um, uh, the receptors. Um, they don't use any other substrates, um, which, you know, I, I think it'd be nice to see, um, nice for me, it'd be nice to see a much more fuller screen done with, uh, you know, that's kind of a, maybe a second paper that they're going to publish. And also, um, and also maybe a broader range of substrates, but anyway, here they look at different variants. And this one, I was a little confused because this is a full change of enzymatic activity, I think relative to the wild type full length MNMC. So this big bar here, which is about fivefold, is wild type C and MNC. So this is just the carboxy terminal domain. So um, the bottom line is that is the best enzymatic activity they've isolated in this paper, is basically just taking the C terminal domain of native MNMC, right? So that's the best. All of these other bars are um, based on this comparison, the structural comparison. They've done mutagenesis of the enzyme, of the active site. Um, you know, so this is wild type full length. So this is set to one fold change. And these are, you know, um, these are different amino acid changes at different positions, right? <clears throat> so cysteine to alanine at position 500, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you don't seem to really get much of an improvement in wild type a little bit with some of these. Uh, these are full-length MNMCs from, um, 
four different other um, microbes. Um, so Vibria cholerae, um, Heliumenescence, A. symbiotica, X. Um, again, none of this, none of these, um, none of these mutations in the uh, full-length MNMC that they did in the catalytics domain, nor any of these other ones, are as good as the carboxy terminal domain of MNMC um, itself. Uh, the question that I have, though, is um, maybe somebody's read this paper a little thoroughly than I have, although I have actually read it a few times, is um, I think these are mutations in, in the full length. And my question is, well, why not just do mutations in the carboxy terminal domain? Because that one is already um, already pretty good. And it seems that oh, uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, ah, John Marlowe, what about veterinary clinics for harvesting the enzyme? I was told that the animals they put to sleep are thrown in a mass grave. It may be easier to gain access to that than someone's grave. Thoughts? <laughs> uh, yes, um, sure. Uh, I don't know if they've, maybe they are thrown into an open pit somewhere. Um, I don't know exactly what the disposal procedures are for veterinary clinics, if there's a, a mass pit somewhere where, where critters are thrown. Um, perhaps. Um, Although you could probably find deceased animals out in the wild in a lot of other places. Um, there's certainly controlled environments where um, people who work on forensics have decaying, you know, big carcasses. Um, I don't think it's pretty hard to find, you know, sites with decaying animal remains. Um, so, so yeah, that, that would be, that would be a, a potential, um, you know, source of, a rich source of enzymes. Um, but anyway, um, going back to the actual enzyme that they isolated here, yeah, it seems, you know, um, if I'm reading this correctly, it seems, you know, here they look at, again, more enzyme kinetics, the velocity of wild type CNMNC, which is here, and wild type, I'm sorry, CNMNC, so just the carboxy terminal versus full length. So, you know, you, you get a better enzymatic rate. Um, this figure here is, um, there's a couple of figures here that, you know, they, they kind of toss in because they try to revisit CML because, uh, if you recall in the first figure when they did the assay, um, carboxymethylysine wasn't really a good substrate. So they managed to get carboxy, they managed to get, a, you know, and this is an acid that they used, which, you know, releases, uh, glyoxylic acid as a, as a consequence. Um, carboxymethylysine only worked very well if, or only worked somewhat well if the enzyme, you know, or the concentration of the substrate was 100 millimolar. And I think it was, uh, I want to say it was an overnight assay. It was pretty, pretty long. It was, uh, actually, no, that's, that's going to, uh, oh, that was looking at, that was looking at modified pe peptide. Um, never mind. But anyway, they had to use a high concentration. So it's again, um, and basically they state in the paper that you know this figure just confirms what they what they knew that CML isn't a very good substrate. So you know they focus on CEL, carboxy uh, ethylysine, as as a medic. Um, but that carboxy ethylysine is only you know it's only a um, it's only a, you know, a modified lysine. Um, they want to actually look at the enzymatic activity of this um, MNMC in the context of a larger peptide. So you know, they have these two substrates, this uh, di, di lysine, this DKP, you know, this cyclized you know, um, substrate, CEL carboxyethylysine here, is the lysine over here, and this peptidomimetic, which is a slightly longer and probably more relevant, you know, substrate. Um, and, you know, the full change in, so they look at activity of wild type C and MMC. So this is now just the carboxy terminal domain um, and a peptide substrate. Um, and they look at release of, um, so full change <coughs> relative to free CEL, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> um, bottom line is, uh, this enzyme works, but not very well on either 
the, you know, the DKP CEL, the cyclized variant. So this is, you know, so if, if the full change of breakdown of free CL is set at one, then it's only a small fraction, um, you know, like looks like about a fifth of, you know, a full change if you have this uh, in the assay that they're running for the DK, DKP cell. And for the peptidomimetic, yeah, they get a breakdown. Um, I don't know what the y-axis here is. It's the abundance counts of release of this, um, you know, um, spartic acid, um, this glutamic acid, amylalanine, lysine. So, you know, the single letter designations for amino acids. So this is a positive control. This is just a free peptide. So this is a peak over here. This red is plus CNMC enzyme. So you see a release. And then this is a negative control of the substrate which is over here, um, this reaction had to go overnight. So this was like an overnight reaction. Um, this time is just time of um, in, in the spectrophotometer. So if you go into the paper, it says, um, uh, what are we talking about here? The times. Um, so the PEPCL is a mature CL modified peptide that's known to bind to positively charged cavity of the B domain of rage. Um, that's good. Um, so to detect activity of CNMSC on PEPCL, an overnight enzymatic reaction containing 16 millimole of peptide substrate and 40 micromolar CNMSC was analyzed by LCMS. And it was, according to their words, modestly converted to um, the, you know, the, the peptide that was released, the DEFK. Um, so it's a very modest activity. Um, I'm not going to go through this. Representative tandem mass spec, this is, you know, just to confirm that this was the end, that this was the peptide that was released from this assay. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here. So, you know, um, I think it's a nice preliminary paper that identifies an enzyme, CNMNC, um, particularly the carboxy terminal domain. Um, more, lots more work needs to be done. I think for me, the strength of this paper is really starting from the beginning, the assay that they performed and the fact that they were able, you know, it's like 2019 and, you know, basically setting up this really, you know, I don't want to say simple, but a very straightforward assay, you know, asking very simple questions. Look, we have a lysine mutant. Can it exist on a, you know, a, a variant of, of a carbox or a version of a, you know, advanced glycation end product, um, you know, carboxyethylysine, can it utilize that as a substrate in, in, in these lysine oxytropes? And the answer is yes. You know, and, and, and so it sets the stage for a lot more other basic research papers, I think, of this nature. And, um, you know, um, it just makes me wonder, you know, when I read this paper, I'm like, huh, like, I wonder why nobody did this, like, decades ago. Right, it's the type of assay that you can you can definitely think of. You know, it's certainly within the realm of, of, of technological feasibility um, for biologists years and years ago, and 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 these types of screens were staple. Um, you know, back in the day, um, and and should be right. I think you know it's a, it's a great time to to kind of bring these types of screens back into play now that we have all the computational tools that we can throw at them. Um, so that's, that's my two cents on this. Um, well, um, if I can comment there a little bit, of course, you have to understand the history of the field a little mm -hmm. bit. And it was only <clears throat> in the 70s, 80s, that people started to realize that uh, age formation in the human body had pathological significance. Mm -hmm. So before that, nobody would have done this screen because they mm -hmm. wouldn't care about its existence. And so it's it's understandable. Then of course, um, biologists also are, are in general not organic chemists. So if uh, a product like carboxylizing is not something you can just easily buy from uh, a, 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 an organic seller, you know, a seller mm -hmm. of organic chemicals, then it will be difficult for them unless they form a relationship with an organic chemistry lab to get access to the product to run the screen in the first place. Now, in the meantime, I know carboxyethylysine and carboxymethylysine are things you can buy. So, so now this is definitely in the last 
10 years or whatever will be within the options of most biology labs. But before that, it would have been a little bit more tricky to run it. Yeah, it also reminds me, I mean, it's also kind of reminds me of the deep connection, you know, organic chemists have to geneticists going, I mean, it, it, it sort of reminds me of, of the, uh, you know, of the initial papers on the lac operon, right? By, um, back in the early 1960s where they needed to have the development of, of substrates, um, you know, substrates for lactose. They needed to have, you know, they need to have, o o you know, O-nitrophenol um, derivatives that can change color, right? And X-gal, so chemists had to devise these things that basically can work, you know, that beta galactosides can chew on and use a color assay. And then, um, uh, who was it? Uh, Jacques Monod and Francois Jacob. Um, basically, the two, you know, the two French geneticists who came up with, you know, discovered how genes are switched on. They they needed those tools of organic chemists to actually set up their assay in order to figure out how these, you know, to isolate these mutations. So. Um, you got something similar here where it's sort of like a, it just seems like very classical, right? You have to have these, you have to have these substrates um, and then you have to have these substrates. You have to develop a screen around these substrates um, to go, go look for them. So I guess it's fair enough that, you know, that ages in general have not been looked at for a very long time. And, you know, and uh, now that the tools, now that the tools are in place, it's kind of interesting that, uh, an old-fashioned screen is what it took um, from from that era um, to, to basically isolate the first kind of enzyme um, that was shown to break down advanced glycation end products and and not um, intermediates. So there are enzymes that break down intermediates. So they talk about these amidori products, which are like on the way to advanced glycation end products. So there are enzymes that break down those, but not the final forms of ages. So now that this paper set the stage, I think it would be interesting to test other substrates, right? It'd be interesting to test, because um, um, they mentioned in the paper, um, so they haven't tested full length modified proteins, you know, they haven't tested cross-linked collagens. Um, they also mentioned um, at the end that uh, uh, MNNC natively acts on nucleic acids, and they say glycated DNA may also be a suitable substrate to test in future substance studies. So they mentioned that, right? So there's a lot of, so at least right now there's carboxy terminal MNMC that scientists have as the baseline that they could use for further enzymatic screens, right? So, so you can then look for enzymes that work better than carboxy terminal MNMC. So, um, <clears throat> so, Hopefully this is kind of the first paper that kind of sets the stage and at least sets a ground level for, you know, future enzymatic screens um, in this direction. That's my, that's all I have to say. That's about all he has to say about that Forrest Gump stuff. We have some more. Um, we have some more questions, but, actually. Uh, um, more general questions. I, I would like to point out, of course, that this was quite easy carboxylizing and metallizing. But if you go, for example, to crosslinks, it will be a whole other challenge because many of these structures, like if you take glucosapine, which we think is the most important crosslink in the human body, uh, as far as I know, it doesn't look like any other molecule that occurs in nature, right? I mean, in fact. The one of a part of the structure, the isoimidazole structure, uh, doesn't even occur anywhere. Uh, there is no chemical that was known until glucosapine was synthesized by the Spiegel lab that had that structure in it. So the uh, the Spiegel lab uh, actually thought that this couldn't even exist. That the structure of glucosapine, as reported in the literature, was wrong. So because it it, it was some uh, a structure that actually was believed to be inherently unstable and couldn't exist. So, uh, I mean, the, the chance that, you know, there is an enzyme somewhere in nature that acts on something similar to glucosapine is very dim. Um, so, you know, that's going to be a, a challenge. Yeah. It's also, of course, there are so many cross-links. So how many of them do we need to break down? Is it enough to fix glucosapine to get the significant effect, for example? 
there? Well, we don't know exactly, but um, what we know is that currently uh, it's believed that glucosapine is the most abundant crosslink. And um, probably, I think that you have to think of about two things. So you have, on the one hand, you have uh, the H additions and the, the, the carboxyate lysine, methyl lysine, these things that where they are only connected to a single amino acid. And then on the other hand, you have the crosslinks. And the reason why they are causing problems with aging is probably a little bit different. I think the crosslinks really have mostly, uh, they, they, they have a biomechanical function. They crosslink proteins together, and that's why they cause problems. While the uh, addition products, uh, such as carboxyl and so on, they could have other effects, such as, for example, uh, interacting with receptors. Yeah, like inflammation. It leads to their yeah. negative health effect. So the crosslinks, um, probably it doesn't matter their exact structure. It only matters how much of them you break, is what I believe. Yeah, so John Marlowe again, that's a basic set of questions. Um, I don't know the percentage for this first question, which is, is it ages that chiefly contribute to the sagging of skin more than other hallmarks? Um, I think so, but I'm not sure. Um, if this is the case, how would one theoretically administer enzyme therapy to rid ages in their skin? Um, I can think of a couple ways that you could administer it. Um, you know, nothing really easy. Uh, you could potentially, you know, I'm going to, I mean, how would you get, how would you get an enzyme targeted? You know, and again, it depends on how big the enzyme is. Um, the most direct way is somehow get it permeable through the skin, right? I know that, uh, I know for, um, there's topical administration of um, epidermal growth factors, right? Which is a small peptide. I don't know what its size is relative to, um, to C-terminal MNMC. And if, I mean, not that C-terminal and MNMC is actually going to be the, the right enzyme, it might be something else completely. Um, if it's small peptide, it, it could be topically administered. If it's, um, if it's something bigger, you know, you might need to express the gene in epithelial cells um, somehow and have it, have it secreted from those cells. Um, you know, so, I mean, the bigger the protein, the more challenging it obviously becomes as far as administration is concerned. That's kind of my two cents on that. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure what's going to be the, the right protein as far as, um, cleaving crosslinks. And as Sven said, it's going to be difficult because we, as we saw in this paper, carboxyethylysine is also, is already a poor substrate for this first kind of in-class protein C and MLC. Um, and the peptidomimetic they use, which is more complicated, but still way simpler than a cross-link, you know, uh, collagen with glucosapine, um, is an even poorer substrate for C and MNC. So, um, you know, is, is C, MNMC going to be the right class of enzyme even? Um, you know, to, to develop, um, maybe not <laughs> based on, based on, you know, based on the activity here. Um, I, I think, you know, for me, again, I'm going to just reiterate, I think the strength comes from now having the kind of the tools in place to isolate better enzymes, um, that this, you know, paper kind of sets the stage with. Um, so that's, that's my comment on that. So of course we all don't really know how much of like a, a clinical collagen loss that is uh, due to advanced glycation and products versus simply you know uh, upregulation of the you know matrix metalloproteinases and the uh, yeah, loss of synthesis in general um, yeah versus just quality yeah and of course it's not just it's not just the skin that you're you're going to be targeting right because these things affect the cardiovascular function so probably more importantly you, you want to get you, you want to whatever enzyme it is you want to get into the cardiovascular system you want to basically get in, into the endothelium you want to you want to make sure that your arteries and you know and your blood vessels are more flexible an interesting question i think is uh, uh, well when i actually don't really know the answer to it 
but uh, when people do chemical peels of their skin, you, re you re replace the collagen with new fresh collagen. And the question is, do you actually deglycate yourself then? Or is it just the new synthesized collagen? Is that, yeah, less non enzymatic glycation in it? Well, if you synthesize a new collagen molecule, it doesn't have any H's in it, so right? <laughs> Your body yeah, doesn't. yeah, I don't. I, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't think chemical peels go that far down. I think you're just getting rid of the the. the I, we could take a look at this. this. Is something that we could easily Google. But I think it's uh, the ca top keratin level. I think if we go into collagen, you're getting into the beta membrane, and at that point, you're like a bright ink, like <laughs> some serious. Yeah, but deeper phenol peels that they use to really boost color, and they 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 go down into the dermis. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't I you know, that's something that uh, be interesting to measure, right? Yeah. It could, it could be, yeah. yeah. There you go. There's a, an interesting experiment in the making. We should all um, have fennel peels for a month. Um, and and, okay. uh, and then uh, compare the results. Uh, up, up, up. A fennel peel, uh, in, fennel peel? And, and, and soak in a vat of purified CNMNC. Uh, probably, probably soak in it for a couple of days, maybe. You uh, probably come I, wouldn't, up, yeah. I wouldn't mix two therapies together, Oliver, because we won't know if any changes, which is which is which. Um, you know, you could go for, of course, ALT seven eleven and. And of course, we're going to need a control as well. Yeah, well, I can have one hand and one bat, and you know, another bat. Mm, I suppose we could do like, we, we, we could divide the face in half like that with a line. And then we'll probably end up looking like that, one of those guys out of Star Trek. Do you remember the half white face, half black face? Do you remember those? Uh, yeah, then yeah, there was and that that led to a genocidal global conflict, didn't it? So we want to avoid that. Well, yeah, well, let's just stick with the, the skin peel um, and try and avoid and try and avoid global genocidal conflicts. Here, that chicken—that's exactly what's happened to the chicken. Look, see. Mm -hmm. So we could try that. We could try that, and then after a month, we we're going to have one face that's all like like roasted, like the chicken. Which is your normal side, and then the other will be all white and pasty, like. Um... Well, you can actually you can actually see see that now with um, <clears throat> there was a there was an image of a guy who's um, a truck driver. This is as an aside. He basically, um, he would drive long haul in some sunny weather where the sun was always on one side, and his face actually, you could see massive wrinkling on one side of his face and significantly less on the other. So, yeah, that's also DNA damage as well. Uh, UV uh, yeah, direct I don't know. DNA yeah. damage. Yeah, but it's yeah. glycation of elastin. I mean, yeah. UV damage is glycation. Yeah. yeah, so you can see from the extra. So it'd be interesting because he's in, he's his own control, right? You could So you could do biopsies off of either side of his face and show that there's more advanced glycation end products on one side versus the other. And also then you could try interventions and see if you can actually make his face look a bit more normal. So, you know, Batman, Batman would be a perfect control. Batman? He's his, he's his mm. own control. Ah, you see. And that doesn't make sense. I thought you meant Batman is in that, that guy in Batman who was like that as well. Is it Two-Face? I don't uh, think we can do anything for Two-Face. Yeah, but I think, um, anyway, I think this, this paper does set the stage. So those of you who are thinking this paper delivered a deliverable that you can take right now. No, sadly, no, but um, it is the first of its kind. Um, an enzyme, you know, uh, assay has been developed to, you know, to basically uh, point the direction for yet more enzymes out there. Um, some of the suggestions people have made online here, you know, looking at, uh, looking at, um, I guess, areas where you have animals decomposing, right? So clearly, clearly there are native um, microbes out there that will 
eat all of this stuff and, and mm -hmm. stuff up and recycle it, right? Whenever there's chemical, you know, bonds, carbon, carbon bonds, carbon, hydrogen bonds, you know, that's energy for microbes and things will evolve to basically um, eat it. And of course, since life has been extant on planet Earth, um, death has always been extant as well. So, you know, obviously you're going to have things evolve to basically break down all these products. And it's just a matter of, of finding these, um, these enzymes. Um, and that's basically what biotechnology does. It finds things that already exist to, for the most part, at least biotech up to this point, and um, uses them as a springboard for further development, right? So finding, you know, TAC polymerase from hot springs for, you know, for, for PCR reactions, um, all sorts of other enzymes, um, you know, CRISPR-Cas9, all of this stuff has been found, found in the wild. So, um, uh, well, we know there are breakers, Oliver. I mean, they're not even the first breakers because we know um, rosmaric acid, <coughs> for example, uh, does break some of the carbonyl uh, groups. There's a paper on that. Um, mm -hmm. which, the question is in vivo. I mean, it also. Yeah. Or en and enzymatically. Yeah. 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 Although probably no surprise that rosemary has been used in what I would call folk medicine or traditional medicines in the Mediterranean for thousands of years. I mean, it's well documented that it, you know, or it's, it's well documented that people think it has medicinal value and I wouldn't be surprised if it, uh, if it does. I actually grow some in my garden myself. Um, but I, I honestly think a lot of these traditional herbs and things are worth another look. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. I mean, there's papers get published all the time where they look at uh, old old literature on on these, and and I would I would say most folk I would say most folk quote unquote folk remedies have a better batting average than than most things that we pull out of an animal screen because most of these remedies have been tried directly on people, right? So you know. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, you have, of course, the ALT711, the aminoguanidine, benfotiamine, pyridoxamine, several, you know, nutrients and the chemicals with uh, anti-glycation uh, compounds that are well documented. But no, I mean, not, example, not against I, cost linking, though. Yeah. But that agibran doesn't break glucosapine, for example, which is the most Im important one. So, of course, mm. the treatment is going to be limited, what it can do. And yes, the, the, the abundance of glucosapine uh, makes people think that it could be enemy number one. Um, out of all the different links, obviously the ones we've talked about today are a, a slightly less abundant type. But I, I honestly think there's room to be optimistic that the solutions are out there. And we've reached the point, you know, in, 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 in the pharmaceutical sort of industry where if a certain compound doesn't exist in nature, then we can sort of even make it ourselves and synthesize chemicals and compounds. So, you know, we, we really are at a sort of cusp where we can custom design our own molecules, you know. So I think that's quite exciting. So Sven, I don't know if you know any of the authors on this paper besides uh, Spiegel, but um, maybe you can shoot a question to them and see what the next, if they can, without them divulging any, anything that they're, you know, working on that they want to have embargoed before they publish. It'd be interesting to see what their next steps are as far as this, you know, as far as uh, this screen is. I'd be interested to know, are they looking for different microbes? Right? Are they, you know, because it seems like that's a rich vein to, to tap into. Um, are they modifying this screen somehow to look for using something other than CEL? Um, I don't know how you can do this to see for, you know, maybe glucosapine, but perhaps, you know. Um, and um, I think I'd also be interested in, yeah, write all this down, we'll send it to them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, if they're if they're if they're looking at mutations of just the carboxy terminal domain of MNMC, because it seemed like in the paper they were looking at mutations of the full link. But um, anyway, just in general, I'll be interested uh, interested to hear if, if if they can divulge anything that they're working on as kind of a, a part two or part three to this paper. Mm -hmm. So yeah, David Spiegel is the only person on this paper that I really know. 
Um, Crawford, uh, I, I know when I was there, he was another professor in the department, but I never talked to him and the other people I don't know. I think most of them are probably from the Crawford lab. Or they, they might be new to the Spiegel lab from after I left. Um, okay, so from Steve to everyone, Renato, Galindo, Caceres, how is progress? In the 2020s, there will be tests in humans according to what I have been reading. Um, I'm not really sure what to make of that. Um, it's more of a general question, Oliver, about the sort of the state of aging research. Um, oh, we get out on a limb there. Um, There's a lot to unpack there. There is. I, I, certainly, I'd say that what we're talking about today, AGE breakers, I think that's quite a long way out. I think there's a lot of work to do. This is really, really preliminary, basic stuff, isn't it, really, as Oliver said at the start. But a more on a more sort of interesting angle, things like senolytics, for example, senescent cell clearance, they're very much a sort of now thing, aren't they? They're happening right now. There are a number of human trials. So all the sens approaches to damage or the hallmarks or whatever you want to call them, they are, they're all at sort of various stages. Um, I think we, I mean, I personally think we'll start seeing some things in the 2020s. I don't know about you guys, how do you feel? Um, hard to say. I mean, unless there's some kind of breakthrough for, you know, um, I mean, based on, for, for, for just focusing on, on AGEs, um, you know, based, based on what I see now, um, probably not in the 2020s, but, um, I don't like predictions just because something could, you could, there be a major discovery in a year and some, everything goes upside. Yeah. Yeah. And what people often sort of do in the community and, you know, I understand perfectly why people do it. They sometimes get a bit over optimistic or a little bit over pessimistic. It's, it's a fine balance. But sometimes people think we, we, you know, yeah, the jobs are good and we might as well turn the lights up and go home. But we're, we're a long way from that. But there is progress going on. But science is slow, right? I mean, it takes time to get these tests done, but they've got to be done. But I also want to point out that glycation, of course, becomes a problem because you have reduced tissue turnover. Yeah, I mean, that's another. Actually, glad you reminded me. That is another suggested alternative to the issue of AGEs. Obviously, SEN's approach is to, to cleave or break them. Um, but another, another suggestion has been um, the actual turnover of tissue, rapid turnover of tissue as a way to dilute, dilute out these things. And that also includes things like uh, lipofusin and some of the other insoluble wastes within the cells as well that they, they suggest turnover of tissue is a possible alternative way of getting rid of it. I don't know if you guys have got any thoughts on high turnover rates of tissue to get rid of them. Yeah, I don't know. Many, many yeah. Well, yeah, actually, just... they're not linear. So, I mean, they are already at a younger age taken care of very well. So. Yeah, and a lot, of, a lot of these proteins that get affected also are part of tissues that don't have a high turnover, like... Um, crystalline in your in your eye for example and i'm also it'd be interesting and it's hard to hard to say how how turnover affects i think um you know these cross-linked ages and how how and and vice versa how these ages affect turnover right because you you well, have they, they, they do slow down turnover right so it's very well known that if you take collagen that has a lot of cross-linking mm -hmm. and ages in it uh, it will be degraded much slower. I mean, that's experiments from the 80s and, and earlier already that people were doing this type of stuff. So, but does, does it? Does, but does it affect? Does it affect? Um, I was going to go in the direction of, of um, uh, somatic stem cell microenvironments. Does it uh, lead to more aberrant? You know, does it uh, screw up? I mean, because you now have an environment where 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 it's the niche is different. Right, so you have these AGEs. Is that now affect somehow your pool of stem cells that are left over? And if you clear out the AGEs, will that somehow improve the turnover? Does this does you do you get like you know what I'm saying? Does, there's sort of a back and forth. Is I I don't know if how well that's been characterized or if that's you know 
because again, we don't have a mechanism to clear out, like they said, say in this paper, there is no really good mechanisms to clear out AGEs, so you can't really, and a lot of these trials, it's, that's one of the problems with AGEs is, is it's still not definitive as to causality or correlation with the disease state. So they mentioned like kidney, like renal failure. It, you, have, you have greater AGEs in, in states of renal failure, but is it just because they go along for the ride or they're actually causing renal failure? And unless you can clear out the AGEs and say, oh, renal, renal function is now rescued, you can't really, it's hard to say. Um, and and that's, that's kind of their point in this paper also is that they need better tools, you know? Definitely true. Um, and again, you know, we are always talking about AGs in general, but one AG is not the other one, right? There are differences. Yeah. Yeah. And when you look at the adducts, as I told earlier, that can bind to cell, cell surface receptors, not all of them will bind to the receptor. Some of them could bind, others could not bind. So there will definitely be differences there. And we don't fully understand these differences as, as of now. And to come back to Steve, you know, you could try to think of um, extracellular ages, you know, in the collagen and, and elastin to get rid of them by just uh, increasing the turnover rate of the extracellular matrix, which is generally extraordinarily slow. Um, the turnover rate of some of our collagen tissues is as low as like once uh, half of it will be turned over over your entire lifespan. So a lot of the collagen in your body is never turned over at all. You could try to push this by, you know, overexpression of enzymes such as matrix metalloproteinases and stuff. But the problem is that you will be walking a very fine balance between synthesis and degradation. And if you get that balance wrong, things could get really wrong, bad, right? If you have too much collagen, you have fibrosis, too little you know, then your tissue starts falling apart. That's also not a, a good idea. Start be... dripping, you know, you love. And then dripping. the other thing is, of course, that these enzymes also can have other effects. They can start to degrade other proteins. They can also start to release uh, short peptides. Like if you break down collagen, you release small peptides, and those small peptides are known to have signaling functions. And in fact, it has been said that um, by Leslie Robert and so on, that the release of these small peptides is actually very toxic. Mm. So, yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> mm. So we'll have to see, won't we? Um, I'd be interested to see um, in the context of something like partial cellular reprogramming of tissues, what sort of effect they have on AGEs, if any, we don't know, do we really? So I'd be interested to see. And yeah, and ditto for things that like, um, like telomerase uh, therapy as well, which increases cellular turnover and also obviously has an epigenetic component to it. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be interested to see. But as far as I know, no one has done that sort of, I wouldn't say basic, but no one has actually sort of set out to answer those questions and, and others like them. So, yeah, so we, 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 need, we need more funding to get these answers, uh, or these questions answered. Okay, so. Hmm. But I was thinking a bit about, we haven't mentioned it, uh, uh, autophagy. I mean, uh, you could reduce the accumulation right by increasing autophagy. You mean intracellular age? Yes. Well, I mean, in, inside the cell, as far as we know, there are probably only a few places where you have an accumulation of AGEs that matter, that accumulate, and that uh, is actually in the histones. That was also shown by uh, the Spiegel lab. Yeah, that's not a good thing. So paper. Um, histones, of course, like you don't have autophagy of histones, right? Um, and then the other place will be in the nuclear pore complexes. But again, you don't really have autophagy of them. So, I mean, that's also the reason why they are accumulating in these structures, because you don't degrade these structures uh, very rapidly. Okay. Hmm. So, early days yet, guys. Yep. Um, I don't think we're going to see any breakers. Probably, we don't really want to say... 2020s i think it's i think it's probably one of the furthest out of the zen strands 
Yeah, um, um, unless you know, again, it's this could something could happen. They could have another screen that's taking place, and all of a sudden they find an enzyme that's smaller and ten thousand times more catalytically active. And there you go. I mean, I and 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 works on a variety of different ages and, and glucose pain. Um, if gene therapy could be an option here, yeah. If but we still need to identify the enzymes and and to. to to, you know, make them into a gene therapy. Because so, if you have a microbial gene that yeah, you yeah. know, then you just like a one one time treatment, and then you have yeah, a, you know. yeah. It could it could you might not even for for topical administration, depending on the size of the peptide, you might not even need to have the gene therapy. You might need to have uh, you know they've they've got ways that you can you can permeabilize it into um, you know into into your dermis. Um, uh, but anyway, that all, that all basically, you know, we, we still need to find those enzymes. So it's, uh, that's why I'm excited about this paper. It sets, sets the ground for the future and hopefully near term discovery of more classes of enzymes that break down AGEs. And um, maybe not this year, but hopefully next year, there'll be a follow-up to this paper. Um, where, where such enzymes are discovered and we can look at their enzyme kinetics. That's what yeah. I'm looking forward to. So, ah, We have a suggestion from Ira. Hello, Ira. Good to see you. Uh, he says, just a suggestion for future shows. I have heard the theme today and on previous shows, he's often here, about uh, natural products, which in the pharma space is a discipline that has ebbed and flowed over the last 120 years since the modern pharma industry's inception. While not as popular today as other approaches, it is one that continues in many labs around the globe. And it would be interesting to see a show on a few random papers, such as natural products and cross-linking as an example. And we can't forget that over 85% of our medicines today still have their origins uh, from nature's metabolites, plants, micro, uh, microbial, and fungus, etc., which is obviously very yeah. true. Yeah, and I think it will be true for many, many years to come. So, yeah, what, what do you think of Ira's suggestion of... Um... Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we, we certainly have, you know, I mean, certainly with, uh, with, um, with plant flavonoids, um, we've, we've definitely discussed natural products on a couple of our journal clubs. Um, so we're, we are not averse to that. Um, the only, you know, the only issues with, with plant flavonoids is, is bioavailability. And getting getting enough of them in uh, to your system, um, you know. I would say, you know, like devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. I would say that, you know, the this the scientist part of me would say, well, obviously we need to have modified variants of these natural products because of increased bioavailability, and that's true. And then the cynic would say, well, you need to also have derivatives of these compounds because they're the only ones that can be patented so I could make money. Um, and that's also true. Um, and, you know, when it comes to, you know, when it, when it comes to pharma uh, developing these, these compounds, um, you know, I mean, maybe there's something, something to be said for somewhere in between, but uh, the driving force, um, at least uh, for many labs, is certainly increased bioavailability of, of these compounds. Um, whether that be through uh, the same compound in a different formulation, meaning it's mixed with a bunch of other um, carriers that help transport this compound into the bloodstream, or it's a modified variant of this compound, usually by adding in a small modifying group like a methyl group or something like that, which makes it more stable in the blood so it doesn't break down, you know, through, you know, through enzymatic activity. Um, yeah, so, so a lot of these... You know, uh, so yeah, I mean, definitely natural compounds are are key to you know, like like the you know, Ira Pastor said, eighty five percent of medicines today. I don't know the exact number, um, but I would probably say it's safely at the low end, roughly half of compounds. You know, are are, are natural product derived. Um, so a very 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 significant proportion. So yeah, of course, um, that's something. So. So I don't really, I don't really like to say that it's either or natural versus this, you know, natural is kind of a, to me, kind of a legalistic term that doesn't really have much 
kind of scientific meaning. It's yeah. you, you basically want to take something, whatever it is, however it's derived in the right dose and the right formulation that's going to be bioactive. Um, and well, the so um, the way that a lot of these medic medicines today are, are found is by high throughput screening. You take like lots of compounds and you screen them and lots of compounds can he mean like 100,000 plus compounds. I mean, there are screens, the average screen size is actually 800,000 compounds that is being used in pharma today. So lots of compounds. Uh, they can be from natural sources, they can be also purely synthetically made. The reason, so they, they have looked at it and they have found that in general, it seems that uh, when you uh, do a screen with natural products, you have a higher hit rate. And the reason for this might be that um, nature is not uh, biased like we humans. So the, 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 the uh, screens that are based purely on organic chemistry compounds that humans have synthesized, it literally is a human who, who decides what structures to make. And you know, you sit down on a piece of paper and you try to make different structures and you will see that, very, that um, if you do it a little bit, a lot of your structures are very similar. Your, your inspiration is limited, right? While nature doesn't have the inspiration limit. So sometimes you will see very weird structures in natural compounds that a human will never think of drawing on a piece of paper. So the, the natural libraries, and in fact, there have been studies on that as well, I think, uh, show that they are way more diverse. They, uh, that's one. Another thing is that the natural compounds, um, in nature, these compounds have, are made by various plants, by various microorganisms and so on. They are made for a specific purpose. Right, so they already have some biological activity, which is why there is also higher hit rate probably for them. Uh, but uh, then, after you identify the hit, it almost always turns out that this natural compound is not the best you can do. When you start to modify it chemically, it becomes generally much better, and that is, as Oliver said, because of, for example, bioavailability. Right, I mean, a, a compound that is naturally produced in a plant, for example, uh, doesn't have to go to the human gut to be absorbed. That's not the, if the uh, plant was made, uh, the chemical was made in the plant for a plant-based function, like say an, a, a hormone, a plant hormone, right? Then it doesn't have the, the digestive systems to cross. So generally when you then take that compound and you will give it to humans, you will find it doesn't get absorbed very well. But if you start modifying the compound, it gets better absorbed. Um, it might not encounter the liver, of course. If it's a, a plant compound that has functions within the plant, it doesn't have to encounter the liver. But the liver is very good at detoxifying compounds. So your compound may just be detoxified very quickly. Uh, however, if you chemically tweak it a little bit, it becomes more stable. So natural pro products are a good source to start. And then in the next step is lead optimization. You modify the compound to make it even better. And that's, uh, the, you know, in general, the best success formula. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's very, very hard to pull out the natural from the quote unquote unnatural compounds just because, you know, it's, they're all, they're both tied into each other. You use that as a jumping off point and you know, and yeah, everything, everything, most of everything is, is, is going to, you know, that's why bio, that's biologically active in humans is for those reasons, as Sven mentioned, it's, it's metformin, going to be found in, Metformin that is derived from the French lily, which is natural in a sense, yeah. it's not anti-glycation effect. Yes, Anyway, oh, metformin is no not present in the lily itself. It's another mm -hmm. compound and metformin is again, a chemical derivative of the natural product. Yeah. Yeah. Hal, hal, halamine, uh, right, is the natural compound called, and then it's modified into metformin. Yeah, okay. okay, so that's a good idea. Maybe in a future journal, pop, we could we could take some of. It'd be interesting to take a couple of compounds that we have right now <clears throat> that are modified, unmodified, and be interesting to do kind of a historical survey of. How these how these compounds were identified and how they became into use. 
um, I don't know. I think I'm going to sign off this journal club by giving a, a you know, suggestion for people who are interested in drug screens and interested in naturally derived compounds and interested to see how politics and pharma and all that other messy stuff that can, you know, help people, but also not help people uh, come into play. There's an interesting book. I forgot the author's names. It's called The Fungus Fighters. Um, and it's a very, very interesting story about two women scient women scientists, female scientists, who worked for the um, here in New York State, where I'm at, uh, for uh, New York State laboratories, and basically how they discovered um, a very potent antifungal drug called nystatin, um, which is basically used globally and has saved countless lives. Um, and it was derived from a fungus that they, they looked at soil samples from around the world and they actually identified this fungus in the soil sample from like in New York. And um, because they worked in a New York state lab and that's where the fungus was identified, that's where the name comes from, New York state, Nystatin. <laughs> um, I bet you didn't know that. And um, the interest, and this was done in the 1950s and um, this drug almost did not make it to market because the researchers, you know, wanted to present the findings to everyone and show them how potent this, this compound was and how it could save lives and how this was basically one of the first antifungal drugs available. Um, and because they presented their, their work, um, they almost couldn't get a patent. And every company that they showed it to said, you know what, we can't make money off of it. So the answer is no, we're not going to make a pharmaceutical out of it. And the compound came this close, which is one of the most life-saving antifungal compounds in the history of antifungal compounds. I think we could check that, but it's very important. Let's put it that way. It's, and, um, um, and it almost never made it to market, not because it wasn't successful, not because it didn't work, but because of the way the market system is structured to basically penalize you if you prematurely announce life-saving um, therapeutic. Um, so it's a very cool book to read on many, many different levels. Um, so check it out, The Fungus Fighters. Um, I could Google it right now. Um, maybe I can give you the author name. Um, kind of apropos of what we've been talking about it, The Fungus Fighters. Yeah, Amazon.com, The Fungus Fighters. Two women scientists and their discovery uh, by Richard S. Baldwin. So um, it was published... Uh, Quite a, quite a long time ago now, right? early 1980s, and, um, and, and their discovery was back in the 1950s. So mm. anyway, just some reading material for those of you interested in, in this area. Fungus fighters. Also sounds like uh, the name of an 80s cartoon. Um, I don't know why, it just gives me that vibe, you know, the fungus fighters. Well, maybe maybe these maybe these two intrepid female scientists could be made into a cartoon to inspire, um, you know, I mean, to inspire scientists, both male, female, and other, um, around the world. Mm. The fungus fighters, caped crusaders, identifying compounds from nature that could save lives. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure somebody can come up with a better tagline. Anyway, um, that's all I have to say for today's Journal Club. I hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. I always enjoy it. Yeah, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining us and also to our, uh, our monthly patrons, the Lifespan Heroes, uh, for making this possible. And I'm just going to talk about uh, the conference again because I know people want me to mention it. Uh, July, we are having a rather nice conference in New York. So if you fancy two action-packed crazy days of science with some really uh, interesting researchers and some experts in biotech business and investment, do come along and you can learn more about that at uh, lifespan.io forward slash conference. And we also today just announced a pre-conference biotech workshop led by Dr. Kelsey Moody from i uh, Therapeutics, who are one of the most eminent companies working in this space regarding aging. And he's uh, collaborating with us on a workshop. So there's more details on that as well on the website. You can find that. And it also leads off from the conference page too. So check that out. 
And we will catch you next time. We don't know what the topic's going to be yet, but it could be possibly Ira's suggestion. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for everybody who's joined us today. And I guess we'll, uh, I guess we'll see you next time. Yep. All right, everyone. Take care and have a great summer. And see you during the summer. Yeah, well, that hasn't happened in the UK yet, so. No. No, unfortunately not. It's delayed. Rain stops playing and all that. But this is the UK. I'm sure the summer will come along. But anybody out there in the audience, if you do happen to find our summer, uh, do let me know. And uh, that would be really great if you could find that. All right. Take care, everyone. <laughs> See you next time. Bye-bye.